coming, um, you know, and so conventions are a great place to learn the new. But the um, um, today is going to be talking, as as Jacita was saying, about the, the forebrain and the sensory. I, I know I do have too much information to share for an hour. So I have everything on the PowerPoint, though. So if you... Um, if I gloss over some slides a little bit faster in the interest of time, it's all there. Okay. Um, so let me start the PowerPoint. So, yeah, I, I really do refer to these two tools as listening tools for the body. Um, most of you know that I'm an occupational therapist. So for me, the body is like the primary whole piece. And the more I learn about mental health, the more I learn about all kinds of different um, frames, I, I, it all comes back to the body, the body, the body, and which is where we come in so beautifully. So yes, these two tools is, as she was saying, a sister company to the Tomatis method. It all comes from the original Tomatis method. Um, it's used for motor skills, used for emotional skills, used for cognitive skills. Um, it's technology um, that's very, very high tech, modifying the music and the voice in real time so that we can impact on brain stimulation. Everybody here may be familiar with Dr. Tomatis um, and, and his amazing life that preceded um, us doing this work today. Um, and just, you know, it's important to know that the first electronic ear was born in 1958. Um, uh, some of us on this call was um, more part of that period um, than I could ever be. Um, and so it's it was an amazing journey to follow those first electronic ears to now. Um, and then also, um, I'm going to be quoting on Norman Deutsch's work also in terms of neuroplasticity today, um, that he also gave a tribute to Tomatis in his book, The Brain's Way of Healing, a nice book to, to actually have in your library. So I'm going to play um, um, for this beginning piece, um, just a video on neuroplasticity, because I think that for all of us doing this work, it's it's good to have the tool and it's good to know, okay, this is the essential parts of the tool, but what does it do in the brain? That's, that's the part. So I'm quickly gonna love that video. I think it's such a nice vi visual for us to, to look at, okay, working with these tools with the brain in mind. Yes, it is practice. But what we could see in this visual of this video is that the practice leads to the pruning of the brain in heightening the things, the pathways that we need and weakening the pathways that we used to accommodate, that we use to save um, the areas that were weaker. Um, and that's really what you want to do. That's the impact that you want to have with any tool that you're using. And, you know, probably some of you have heard me say this before. A tool is only as good as the one who knows how to use it. So therefore, we need to turn to this neuroplasticity piece and figure out, okay, so what does this mean um, for me in terms of what we do in the tools that we're using? The first stage is neurostimulation. This is according to neuroplasticity research. This is the first stage of healing. So this is when you're giving light, sound, electricity, vibration, movement, thought. And so you're reviving some dormant circus in the brain circuits that were no longer activated. Your second stage is then getting that modulation um, between those systems. You, you know, we all talk about the parasympathetic and the sympathetic system. We all talk about that autonomic pieces, right? But that regulation in the brain is, a, is almost a higher sense of, of modulation that has to occur between different networks. You know, when I'm thinking about writing an essay, I'm visualizing um, a play that I had with one of my peers two weeks ago. And I'm thinking about that network of visualization and pulling that up. And then the next moment I have to go into a different network and I have to connect that visual picture to something that I have to write about in words and language. So doing this modulation that I can effectively switch between one network in the brain and the other as I'm needing it in the present moment while also reflecting on past moments and past experiences. This regulation is an incredibly important piece for us to think about in um, neurodevelopment. So your sleep-wake cycle and your overall level of arousal, 
all those things are incredibly needed for us to do that. The third stage is to get to a stage of derealization, that you're able to accumulate the energy that you need to recover in times of stress, that you're able to access a relaxed brain. All of us know what it feels like to be stressed. We certainly have gone through a global pandemic of COVID that we all realized and really heard the word stress every single day of that entire time. I'm still hearing it, not as much, uh, thankfully, but it's still there. Stress takes us out of this bid for relaxation. And so what we often find in the clients that we see is that where you and I know what it feels like to get into relaxed mode, I can think right now what I do when I'm relaxed. Maybe I'm sitting with my feet on my couch. Maybe I'm watching a, a stupid movie with my husband, but I'm feeling like maybe I have a little glass of wine next to me, right? I know that feeling that I get when I'm in that mode. But many of our clients have no idea what that feels like. Their vigilance, their heightened stress levels are keeping them at the arousal level that is not optimum for this piece because neurolexation is what we need to ready the brain for learning, right? So that is a connected piece for us. Then the fourth and final stage is making sure that when the brain is rested, the circuits can regulate themselves and get them geared in to, in, to learn and to be ready for the day at school, to be ready for the day at college or university, wherever we are. And that's that finer distinctions that we can use as you are using right now. So very short look at neuroplasticity, but I wanted you to know this because these two tools are absolutely pristinely involved in this process. You are able to change the brain with these tools. Um, the electronic ear itself that we got from the tomatoes method, it's all about receiving the sounds um, and making, there's a passive piece to it, there's an active piece to it, responding to sounds, listening to ourselves, our own voices. There's a, a amount of control that comes from that. And part of this whole auditory tool, sound tools for the body, is about that auditory system is so involved in predicting forward what's going to happen. You know, when you're learning a song for the first time right now, but you hear the chorus the second time, you can start singing along. Why? Because you've been hearing it before, and now you can start predicting how what it's going to be like so you can join in, right? And that auditory forward prediction, so crucial for us to get activated for good auditory processing skill, which is very essential for learning. Um, so when we th think about involuntary attention, you know, attention without thinking about attention, um, there is an orienting reflex theory that came out in 63, which posits that a neural model is built from repetitive features of the external stimuli. So part of this methods that we are using is to repeat repeat the forebrain, repeat the sensory. And that repetition is supporting how, you know, the networks is stirring up, stirring up, getting the stimulation in and making the stimulation and the pathways that's being woken up by the stimulation to actually become the new habit. That's, that's what you essentially are doing. And so when we turn to bone conduction, it's so, um, um, cool to think of bone conduction in our world it's like a normal world right but when we move outside of the, the this world the, the community that we all of us belong to there is so many people who don't understand you know what do you mean bone conduction right so it is an alternative route very very used by by a deaf persons when they speak right and you they're speaking through feeling the vibration in their jawbone as they are making the sounds um, and they can do that to a pristine quality it's amazing so bone conduction is flexible it can be used in many different ways stimulating that inner ear listening to myself as i'm listening you know um, to myself i'm able to pace my words and make sure that i'm clearly articulating the thoughts that I want to present to you today. Um, so there's a, a tension in my body as I'm putting this forward to you, but it's a healthy tension, a tension that keeps me on an arousal level that allows me to pace 
and and to and to bring forth the thoughts and ideas I want to share. It so continuously as I'm speaking, I'm evaluating what I'm saying at the same time. And so it also helps me to know, oh Maud, you, you're really falling over your words a little bit too much, right? So maybe just slow down so you can get your thoughts out clearer. And that's that that um continuation of adjusting my voice to the feedback that I'm getting the whole time. That is an essential part that bone conduction plays um, a huge role um, or where bone conduction plays a huge role. So we cannot talk about bone conduction, not also talk about the a vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a huge, huge compilation of neuronal activity that we are finding out more and more and more the power of. Um, and bone conduction is like the vagus nerve compatriot, okay? So when we do the sound stimulation, it affects the autonomic changes, the sympathetic, the parasympathetic, and especially the vagus parasympathetic. Um, kids, all, kids really do have a good feeling of sympathetic. They, most of our kids who are developing brains, they are in sympathetic arousal, right? They understand that part. What they don't get is how to get to the parasympathetic. And that follows through to adults when you're working with adults. About a third of my population in my clinic now is adults. And I do this very similar work with them as I do with children. Plasticity does not stop at any age. It continues. And so I talk the same type of language with the adults, of course, in an adult language style, and they can understand more vocabulary around it. Um, but you want to use, think about how I can utilize these tools to get the vagus system to get to a place of neurostimulation where I can be relaxed enough to learn. Crucial. And so a little picture that I found on the internet, just to give you the difference between the vibration that's coming through the ear for air conductioning, and then when you have a bone conduction vibrator, either here or on the top of the head, um, the vibration goes straight to the cochlea, right? So it's it's a definitely faster route. Um, 10 times faster is what the literature is saying. So this vibration activates on the skull. The skull vibrates. It gets to the cochlea through the ripple effect that it has um, from the skull to the cochlea. And then the vibration of the cochlear fluid is then activated to give us a supported sound. And so I've given you the source also for this picture um, to understand that air conduction, bone conduction, are they have different relay stations in the brain. There's a tonotopic map for every single frequency that has to relay through, through the cochlear nucleus, through the, the thalamus, into the brain, so that the brain can be able to assimilate both ears information simultaneously at the same time. It's a very um, uh, pristine process. Um, and why also this is important for us to understand and why auditory tools are so crucial is that in Dr. Seth Horowitz's research, when he in his book he calls about um, he calls it the universal sense, he talks about the research that they've done between how visual system takes in information and how the auditory system takes information. So the visual system takes in about 15 to 25 events per second. Hearing is thousands of times per second. So the, the ability to use auditory system for maximizing neural stimulation in the brain is absolutely beautiful, right? And so many of us work with kids and adults where they are so over-reliant on their visual system for information because they can control that visual system as the slower rhythm and speed to take in information and they shut down their auditory information, right? Well, they're using... They, while well, they're losing basically a whole amount of information when they shut down their auditory system. And you know that that could be a physical piece, neurophysiological, but that can also be emotional, right? I'm just not going to hear what you have to say. I'm just not going to hear it, right? And it's waking up that I'm able to hear and able to assimilate the information at the same time. Don't hear me say, that these tools are instrumental for changing auditory processing disorder, okay? 
We're not talking about that. We're talking about well-being, um, the listening sense, using the listening sense for the well-being of all these other different functions. Um, so which makes these important tools when you think about this literature and what's available for us to understand. So when we speak, right, I'm projecting the sound into the air as I'm speaking, but the higher sounds have got a much more straight trajectory where the lower sounds have more dispersing around us, comes around. Um, so at the same time, my skull is vibrating, my jaw is vibrating as I'm, as I'm getting these messages in expression and reception. And this is what great singers know to do. They're singing through bone conduction. Beautiful. So we know about the mother's voice. The mother's voice is conducted to the fetus through the spinal column. There is no place that we can escape bone conduction in this world. Even when you are deaf, you have bone conduction available to you to use. I, I looked at the video once of a very, very famous drummer. I just didn't remember her name. But um, she is absolutely a, a professional in, in drumming, completely deaf. And she drums with her feet bare on the floor. So she insists on a certain type of floor when she's doing her drumming so she can feel the rhythm the vibration through her body when she's doing her drumming incredible incredible what it can do so in from the fetus the bone conduction is an important message of adjustment of attachment of attunement of access to my listening body of being available for the learning and the growth that needs to come and that mother-child bonding process is such a cr um, critical piece for us to understand when we look at relationships and as a whole. And so there are different times and spaces of the fetus into the first months um, where this develops. First, really between 200 to 4,000 hertz, then sounds of speech sounds, then the body can move differently towards different sounds. And so the body... The baby synchronizes body movement to the voice within 20 minutes after birth and then trains to the speaker. Isn't that cool? Um, so really ha um, having these tools to, to harness past memories, to harness past places of being, to harness learning of the present, to be um, harnessing what future orientedness I have, all of that is incredibly emotional, linguistic, and physical so when we use our voice the air from our lungs comes through the trachea to the larynx the larynx is vibrating it's all about vibration to produce the sound if you're talking and you put your hands here across your throat you can feel the vibration as you're speaking um, and this vibration is then diffused throughout the body um, the first step in controlling the sound of our voice will be will produce the most fast, I'm sorry about that bullet point, the most direct and the most fastest. There's also the resonators, the pharynx, the nasal cavity, the mouth, the lips, before the, the leaving the mouth for sound. So important to have this area activated to feel the sound as it is speaking. And so it allows for two levels of control to alert the brain to focus on a very specific frequency range which is quite neat. Oh, just a little um, <laughs> factoid here. Cats purr at the frequency between 25 and 150 hertz. And think about when we, you know, look at the different hertzes when we do a sound spectrum. Um, but vibrations in the body have shown to promote healing. And what they found with the cats purring, that, they, um, that the purring helps them to increase their own bone density. Isn't that cool? Um, and so... When we look at athletes and research on athletes, they also have denser bones on average as a result, as that vibrations through the floor are hitting their body. So yes, we, we definitely from all kinds of vantage points can look at bone conduction. And Beethoven, it's not a new thing. Beethoven became deaf. And when he became deaf, he used a steel rod, a metal rod in his, that he clenched in his jaw to, to feel and hear the compositions he was making right 
So um, it's um, it's not new. We figure this out, and I just I'm just amazed when I think about that story. So what happens when you have poor bone conduction? Your your voice sound is more nasal. I can't do that really accurately, but it's more nasal. It's more throaty. Um, there's also a fatigue in the voice. Um, body awareness is involved. Sometimes the speech is it, it, it comes out in spurts as it is hesitant. Um, there's not enough articulation. Um, sometimes you don't even feel you can get emotion from the voice, right? It feels expressionless. Um, and also um, what they're also finding is that in other research is that when you hum, right, bone conduction is then activated, which is also used in um, in some other trainings that we have in the tomatoes method, the humming sound to focus. Um, and we see kids do that at school. So this is a slide that may be familiar to most of you, but we do have a listening posture. And why do I want this up here? Not because I'm going to go through all of this with you, but because the listening posture is incredibly important when we use these tools. It's very um, crucial that when we put the forebrain on, that we are not sitting in this kind of posture where our whole diaphragm is now changing the quality of my voice, but that we're sitting upright, right? Um, some of my teenagers love to read um, with a forebrain on while they're lying flat on their back. Well, I ask them to have a much flatter cushion or pillow behind their legs so they can get that emulated posture. But of course, I prefer them to sit up straight um, when they're doing the forebrain. But teenagers are teenagers, so sometimes you have to find a way in um, to get what you need. So I'm going to um, go over to the actual forebrain, um, dead on time, so we're good here. Um, and let's just watch a, a little clip here on the forebrain. Is it safe to feed dogs raw food? Of course, we're going to have YouTube ads. It would be like feeding cows rats, or bees. Much like a computer, when the brain forms memories or learns a new task, it encodes the new information by tuning connections between neurons. With 87 billion neurons and the possibility that each of these can establish as many as 30,000 connections, the possibilities for brain development are endless. Recent discoveries have shown that even the adult brain has the ability to change or to produce new connections between different nerve cells. And this uh, subscribes the possibility to keep growing and making new uh, functional developments across the entire life. As technology and information continue to expand, cutting edge instruments are becoming available to enable a more customized and individual approach to learning. But simply neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain and the neurons to uh, make new connections. Auditory feedback is a technique that promotes brain plasticity. Developed by Sound for Life, Forebrain is a simple brain training device based on the principle of neuroplasticity, which was created to improve auditory processing and to enhance speech, memory, and attention. Forebrain is a speech and brain training headset using groundbreaking technologies to create an enhanced auditory feedback loop in order to improve speech, attention, and memory abilities. Forebrain was the first uh, product developed by Sound for Life based on its strong connection with the Tomatis method, the most uh, advanced uh, program in sound therapy and also its cooperation with Aftershocks, the world leader in bond conduction. The idea behind Forbrain was to create a product which can be used by the whole family for the purpose of learning. Forbrain modifies the sound of the user's voice in real time via a dynamic filter, which uses vibration to alter and improve the perception of the voice and works simultaneously on all aspects of the audio vocal loop. Forbrain is using two types of technology bond conduction and dynamic filter. The dynamic filter alternately amplifies high frequencies and attenuates low frequencies of the voice. And this resulting perceptual contrast constantly surprises the brain and forces it to stay focused. 
bone conduction is 10 times faster than air conduction. And it's also the most natural way to hear ourselves. The dynamic filter and bone conduction also has an impact on the vestibule, the part of the ear in charge of the sense of balance, coordination, motor planning, spatial orientation. So many things that are quite crucial in order to learn correctly. Cobrain brings clearer speech quality and rhythm, better listening skills, greater focus and concentration. Since its introduction, the product has been endorsed by thousands of therapists and has won several awards. Well, I hadn't come across a tool before that uses bone conduction um, and it enhances your speech automatically. So you have automatic feedback about how your speech sounds slightly louder. Um, I found that really, really powerful for boosting self-awareness in kids. I love that it's wireless as well. It's really practical for while we're moving about and playing in the room together. And uh, the kids think it looks cool. They think they look like a pilot or some type of police officer or something. And so they're really happy to wear it as well. As an occupational therapist, I work with children with various diagnoses. I focus on motor skills, sensory processing, attention and focus, all things that can really have an impact on a child's ability to learn, grow and develop. Um, I use a lot of different therapeutic tools. I use swings, games, toys, movement. Um, and the forebrain is a great tool that still allows me to use those activities as they were designed. It doesn't impact the therapeutic use of those tools. The child can still hear my directions, can still listen, focus, and attend while they're in session. I like to use forebrain because it's a really easy to use tool within my therapy sessions. Well, I've seen general improvements in memory, concentration, ability to focus and stay with an activity, but definitely the most impressive results that I've seen are in your self-awareness and in increased vocalizations. I really have the feeling that with Forebrain, I learn better and faster and that my voice have a positive impact uh, on my brain. For example, during the exams, it's like I could hear myself uh, speaking, so all the information came back really easily. Forebrain allows users to be at the center of their own learning by using one's own experience and repetition to enhance their knowledge. Via a process similar to how babies learn to walk or talk, it progressively educates the brain to correctly analyze speech, sound, and at the end, any sensory information. Wearing the forebrain really helped Josephine focus her attention. The forebrain made her more aware of her own speech as she was talking, so she could hear mistakes as they were happening and work to correct them. She started to notice errors in her daily speech, and she was able to improve her pronunciation even when she wasn't wearing it. The impact that this had on her intelligibility was incredible, and we were really surprised by how quickly we saw results. When I wear the forebrain, I can hear my own voice. It's like I'm talking into a microphone to see if I'm saying words properly. I used to say loop, but now I can say soup. I used to say wit, but now I can say fish. I used to say women, but now I can say swimming. It's fun to wear the full brain. I look like a singer singing into a microphone. Several researchers have conducted studies using forebrain and have concluded its positive impact for varied applications, like enhanced reading, better quality of speech, and improvement of cognitive functions. Uh, we have conducted a scientific uh, study aiming at validating the principles of action of a brain on the voice of its users through a randomized uh, double-blind controlled study. The results of this study encouraged me to believe that for brain can be used in domains in the speech therapy clinics and also in, in cases of central auditory processing disorder. And the results were so important that were published in the prestigious journal of the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association. For more information, visit forebrain.com. It's a quest. This is a sound wave. Sound is all around us. I like that video. There's so much there that I think we can use to explain to others and to show them what it is that we do. Um, 
So yes, we heard reading skills. I use it so much for reading, focus, attention, concentration, um, motor coordination, praxis. And, and you would think that the tool can be in the way, you know, as, as the OT described, but it's not. You can actually use this as you are doing all kinds of physical activity as well. Um, so there is this microphone, there's the filter that's attached to it. Um, and this, this, it dampens the lower frequencies from the background while it enhances the frequencies that we use for the voice um, in the foreground. So, um, and that's a, that's a key piece to why it works. And so when you're looking at the forebrain, you have the bone conduction transducers because yes, the bone conductions are right here, the microphone that's over here, and then you have the filter that's over here. And, and now with the latest forebrain, you can also add a little cord for a microphone that the therapist or the adult facilitator could use to speak directly to the child as well through, through their forebrain. So, um, which is quite interesting. Um, our speech pathologist is still working with that and letting us know how that's going for her um, as she she ha she's now in this journey of exploring this. Um, the the um, secondary microphone that I'm talking about could be used, um, you know, between a, you know the forebrain user, the instructor. It could be a parent, a teacher, a therapist. It could be a voice coach. Um, and help with all kinds of things. Um, in our center, we definitely use it in speech pathology. Um, but it's also something that can be useful when a tutor is sitting to, with a child and they're using the forebrain while they're doing the tutoring. Or the parent is working with the child on, say, reading and maybe reading together. Um, when our dyslexics are starting to read words, it's so important for the parent to also be able to, in the microphone, speak to the child the word that they're struggling with, right? To help them over the lexicon. Articulation, um, easier listening in general. So you can also connect the forebrain to another source of sound. You can, um, you could use it for online courses. You can homemade recordings and um, taking voice notes from what's happening um, uh, in a lecture that you're listening to later after you've uh, recorded it. Um, apps, speech, foreign language learning, the, the applications are actually quite varied. So, so when you do this auditory vocal loop, which again is probably for me the most pristine piece of the whole forebrain piece, it's the quality and the rhythm of the voice that changes. When we started full brain years ago, um, you know, like everything, I'm, I'm not always quite sure of new tools coming out, as I'm certain I share that with many of you. Um, and so what we did is we took 10 kids in our office in, in a one week period, and we had them read for one minute without the full brain. And then we had them read afterwards with the full brain, just right after. Right. And so we, we recorded this on video um, and then we looked at that. And we saw, well, this is years ago, right? So this is even before the current USBs and whatever. But um, the um, we looked at the, the videos, the same child, same moment, same same clothing, everything, you know, it's the same time. You see that when they start reading, they read blah, 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 blah. And then they put the forebrain on and they go, oops, they lift up the book and they start doing this and they look up in surprise and they write. And you have these responses that are so cool to see, as I'm sure some of you have seen, um, that you can immediately get that feedback, that auditory feedback. That is so cool. I use other programs that also uses feedback systems and with great success. And so the forebrain makes a huge amount of sense to me. Um, it is a usable product. And of course, the research now has proven this. So you can use it anywhere, within treatment sessions, within classrooms, within language laboratories, um, as part of a home program. Um, I've also, um, maybe a little um, tidbit here, done this with some university students who are having trouble with, say, attention at school, arousal level at school, um, and getting through their learning in a, in a way. So when they are cramming for an exam, which most of us tend to do when we're at university. Um, I, I have them read with the forebrain the material they're trying to cover for 10 minutes, right? And then um, they, they read, they just simply read what it is that they need to learn. 
And then they, they take the forebrain off and they start to summarize what it is that they were learning. And you would think that that's some process that maybe takes a bit longer to learn a material. Oh my goodness, how amazing was that? So the next hour they do the same thing. And the next hour they do the same thing. And you would say, yeah, we don't typically do forebrain more than once a day. But this is a cramming situation on a university student that has, in, that has got high quality skill, very high um, uh, adaptability, and you can do this, right? This is a wellness piece for them, and it just enhances their learning. So that might be something that you could try. Um, but so I've, I've used forebrain in many different ways over the years, um, going a little bit out of the box and then sometimes staying in the box. Um, but for most periods, I use it in between um, my talks up intensives and I use it very much for a home program and so forebrain is now for me a necessary tool it's not an optional tool um, lots and lots of research in it I'm not going to go over this because I think we can all go to that um, website the forebrain.com website the link I gave you in the slides so that you can go and look at the scientific studies that's coming up and yes, it's an awarded program from, you know, almost, I think, I think Full Brain was out for three years and it got its first award, right? So um, very cool product. Moving over to Soundsory for the last part of our discussion today. This is, an, this is a little bit of a different tool. There's a multi-sensory component to it where it has the movement piece, it has the auditory piece. And those of you who've done training in sound before, you know, you cannot separate the auditory piece from the vestibular piece. Neuroanatomically, it is linked, right? When you move better, you also listen better. We have found as occupational therapists in, the, in our centers that oftentimes we put the kids on swings and suspended equipment and things like that. And suddenly the child starts speaking more. They start vocalizing more. They start making more sounds if, they're not, if they are nonverbal. Why? Because the movement elicits sound. They work together. And so this little program um, has been amazing, amazing for me to work with. Um, it is cool. It is very universal. It is very um, um, catchy when you're doing it yourself. Um, and it just elicits in you a need to want to move. So think about all our lovely, um, can I say, in loving respect, couch potatoes out there, right? Um, and think about getting them going. Just just get them going. Let's get that firecracker, right? Well, the sound story is my firecracker. And so um, you can use it for all kinds of pieces from motor delays to developmental delay, autism, sensory processing, attention. Um, it, it has multiple places of application. What I, what I don't want you to hear me say Sensory, as in forebrain, as in any other tool I use, is never a complete cure for anything. It's a tool, an additional tool, that if you learn to use it well, you can cause wonderful change in your clients. Wonderful claims, um, change in, in how you're approaching the method. So the, this rhythm that's in there, you know, I've worked for long years of my life. I've worked with timing. Timing to me is a pristine piece of work that needs to happen in the brain for that neuroplasticity. But I've always had problem with the rhythm part. Even though the talks up, of course, gives us rhythm and timing, I needed something in addition for rhythm because rhythm precedes timing in the brain. The baby has rhythm available to it from the get-go. We see babies rock themselves in their beds to, to soothe themselves to sleep, right? So rhythm is an essential buildup for timing, right? So the sensory rhythm program is a regulatory tool that I use to get the body in such a rhythm with itself so that the timing work can happen in a more pristine way. Um, and the um, the sources that is inside of the program, from Bach to Haydn to Strauss to marches, children's songs, um, gospel music, it, it just talks to everyone. Um, there's nine tracks in total, with each song lasting long enough for the brain to get the rhythm 
but is still short enough so that it avoids habituation. Now, in learning, we do want habituation. But when we're stimulating the brain to learn, we don't want habituation because we don't want the child to get so used to the music that they're not really taking it in anymore. That's it's lost its energy, right? So therefore, it's perfectly worked out with filtering that you are able to keep the brain stimulated the entire time that you're listening, influencing the dynamics of learning. So in, in a, as a complement to the sensory program, there are body movement exercises that can be accessed on the website once a sensory has been purchased and that you can do through these three to four exercises per day and choose them as you need. Um, and some of us may also be designing our own exercises pertaining to our individual clients' needs. That's absolutely open to you. It's a flexible tool. Um, so you want to focus on the nervous system, the rhythm control, the balance, and also, of course, you are working with both ears, so both hemispheres are going to be stimulated. So we have a little video to watch on the sensory. This is Dave, head of marketing at a ketchup company about to use Grammarly to handle a tight deadline. How to use your sound Siri. First, turn on your sound Siri by pressing and holding the lower button for a few seconds until the screen displays welcome. Make sure the headset is charged enough before starting a session to avoid any interruption. To get all the benefits from the listening program, make sure that the headband is in direct contact with the top of your head. You also need to note the left and right marks and ensure the sides are in the right position while putting on your headphones. Press the play pause button to start listening. To stop listening, Press the play pause button a second time. To adjust the volume, use the up and down buttons on the side of the ear shell. The sound must be neither too low or too loud. If you turn off and on the headphones, the sound will revert back to the preset volume of 11. If you are setting the headphones for another person, make sure they are adapted to his or her own sensitivity. But all exercises are available at soundsory.com. To charge your soundsory, connect it to a standard USB port on your computer or wall charger with the provided cable. When fully charged, the screen will display a battery icon. You can also use the device as Bluetooth headphones to listen to regular music and even make phone calls. Simply switch the button from TF to the Bluetooth logo. Then select Soundsory in your device Bluetooth settings. When used in Bluetooth, the bone conduction sound will be automatically disabled. To turn off the device, Press and hold the lower button for a few seconds. For more information, visit www.soundsory.com. Um, I see that somebody's raised their hand, Josita. If you can just hear what that's about, that would be good. I... We do have a lot of questions, so I've noted them all down and Maud will answer them at the end of the webinar. Okay. So you can just then write the questions in the chat or in the QA section, that would be good. So I'll just continue shortly as we're almost done with this part of the webinar. Um, so basically the protocol is 30 minutes per day for 40 days, or we do two blocks of 20 days with a three week break in between 
five to seven days per week. I've also done this answer, you guys, a little bit of a uh, another adaptation. I've done it where they did twice a day, um, where they do one in the morning and one in the evening. Um, and this is especially in, in very um, strong body types of medical conditions um, from cerebral palsy to um, tuberous sclerosis, um, Rett syndrome, um, some really um, strong medical diagnoses that, that need that additional piece where the rhythm was disturbed from the get-go, right? And so, um, so yeah, I've, I've had other cases as well too, but those will be individualized. Um, but I just thought I'll mention that, that that's also a possibility. Um, so there are scientific studies in progress when looking at the sensory. And some of you may have already seen the video I just showed you, but really why I like that video, it completely explains every part of it, right? It's not about the how-to, which is good to know anyway, but it's also all the different pieces that's involved in that. And this is the beauty of technology today. Um, you know, I am certainly not a technology queen. I, I really struggle to, <laughs> to adhere to all the technolo technological changes that's happening today. Um, and I really have to put wrap my head around it. And I'm thankful I have a team around me that supports me. But I tell you, there is an amazing amount of work that can be done today that's so much faster than when I started out being a therapist. Um, so they're looking at anxiety, they're looking at depression in elderly patients. And that's kind of, I think, an interesting one. So, Josita, for this last couple of minutes of the webinar, I will turn it over to you. Oh. Okay. Um, so, the forebrain, how does the forebrain affiliate, actually, the Sound for Life affiliate program work? Because there's a new intro, uh, introduction. The um, historically, what was called the forebrain affiliate program is now the Sound, Sound for Life affiliate program because your same affiliate code can be used on both Forbrain website as well as Sansuri website by your clients to get a 10% discount using your code and you will get a commission for the units sold using your code. Um, the great thing is that all of this can be managed from the same backend. You can track your sales from the same backend. You can um, transfer your commissions again from the same backend. Um, so I pretty much explained the, uh, the affiliate program to you. Uh, we give every professional a unique affiliate code. The code would be you, you can forward it and recommend it to your clients, forward it to your clients, and they can use that code at the checkout page of either of the websites, Forbrain and Sansory. They will benefit from the discount and you will get a commission 